Good morning, everybody. Well, it's the second Sunday of Advent. The topic is peace, and the scripture uh, we begin with is Isaiah 9, 6, probably one of the most well-known passages in the entire Bible. It's a prophecy by Isaiah about one day a leader coming who will bring peace to earth. And here's how it reads. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. And so this is a, a promise, um, a prophecy, that one day God is going to bring uh, peace to earth, and it will come from outside of ourselves. Now, each of us is different. Some of us are worry warts. Others of us are not. Kathy tends to have more anxiety and worry than I do. But this piece that we are talking about today is not about um, manipulating an inner disposition. Um, and it's something where I would ask you, are you aware of having peace? in this very difficult world that we live in, dangerous world, um, problematic problems come to us. Are you aware of having a peace that comes to you from outside your normal disposition and gives you something that you, from the inside out, would not otherwise have? Do you have that thing from God? Well, I'm going to jump now to the book of Philippians. And in this letter, the Apostle Paul, who's in prison, has been beaten. His life is threatened. He's been beaten um, within inches of his life. And he's able to write this. This is chapter 4, verse 6. He says, be anxious about nothing. Jesus said the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be anxious. Well, I assume if Jesus said, don't be anxious, and Paul says, don't be anxious. It must be possible to at least some degree to not be uh, debilitated with anxiety. And then he goes on. In everything, this is such a hard teaching. In everything, regardless of the nastiness of the situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then the peace of God from outside to you uh, will guard your heart. Uh, and the word guard there, it's like an army is surrounding a city. And if you're in the inhabit, an inhabitant of that city, it's your army protecting you from intruders. You feel safe. You feel secure. Uh, there's a calmness that you can have. And, and, and this kind of peace can protect you that way. And then Paul writes, here's what to do. Think about these things contemplate them, chew, chew, chew on them, really get it into, your, into yourself. Contemplate what is true, honorable, and right. And the list goes on, but I want to stop with true and right. And then in verse 11, he says this, I have learned. I, Paul, have learned. In other words, he didn't have peace before. Now he's got peace because he's learned it by contemplating, chewing on, thinking about what's true. And he says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Peace is a big business industry today. Pharmaceuticals companies are making billions of dollars selling all kinds of meds, which make the promise to calm you from your anxiety, um, calm your fears, uh, and bring you a kind of a peace. And of course, illicit drugs are sold all over the place to achieve that same purpose. And then there are techniques, yoga, meditation. If you go to the Christian bookstore or any bookstore, Barnes & Noble, you will see books on how to relax, how to get moments of peace uh, into yourself. And these are almost always techniques 
things that you can do to manipulate your moods, but this is different, quite different from Christian peace. Christian peace comes from the outside in to you and it guards you, it protects you. It's found in a different way. So, uh, what I have found is that um, my foundational means of thinking about how to what Christian peace might be is is this. I was reading Deuteronomy chapter six and eight many 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 years ago, and in it the um, Moses is giving the Israelites a great pep talk, his final speeches before they enter the promised land. And Moses says, be careful when you enter the land that I'm giving you. Remember, I'm giving it to you as a gift. And you move into houses that you did not build, uh, take over a land that you did not purchase, and uh, feed on crops and, and livestock that you did not cultivate. And as I thought about that, I thought to myself, yeah, wow, that is so true of me in my life. Everything that I experience that's good in my life is all gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. Colossians chapter 1 says, Jesus created everything and Jesus sustains all things. So it occurred to me, if I'm, if I'm living on planet Earth and I'm able to breathe, that's a gift. Jesus is sustaining planet Earth. I was born. I had nothing to do with that. I just showed up. My mom and dad had something to do with it. And then, so that was a gift. And I didn't get to choose my mom and dad, but uh, they were a gift to me a mom and a dad who loved me and stayed together. What an incredible gift. And my genes, I have nothing to do with my genes. They were given to me. And so any friends, any motivations, anything I've ever done that's good or worthy of anything is has its genesis, its foundation, not in anything that I have achieved, but it's all gift. And I remember that phrase coming to me decades ago. Jeff, it's all gift. And you, Jeff, can claim credit for none of it. And I'm convinced of that. And it's buoyed me. It's, it's given me a strength over the years because the moment I begin to think I can take credit for this or that, the moment, that's the moment that the phrase, it's all gift, comes in, intrudes, and puts away the credit because uh, credit, when you try to take credit, you'll never feel like you have enough or you have your uh, pride comes in and then you're unhappy, you're unpeaceful again, you're restless. Same thing with the word deserve. God has given me the grace through this concept of it's all gift to be able to realize that I don't deserve anything. I haven't earned or deserved anything. Here I am. Uh, having received the gift of being placed on this planet into God's story for his purposes. And I'm just here. And it's every resource that uh, is available to me that I've availed myself of is a gift. Jesus was teaching and people asked him questions and one of the questions people asked him had to do with this issue. And the question was, Jesus, there are these people up in the area called Siloam. There's a big tower there. And Jesus, we, we heard about this. That tower fell on, on 18 people and killed them. And I remember the first time I read that and subsequent readings. And I thought to myself, uh, what is Jesus going to say to that? And what he said is exactly the opposite of what I thought he would say. What he said was, be careful that the same thing doesn't happen to you. 
What happened to them is their story. What happens to you is your story. Your story, as you know by now, is all gift. But the truth is you don't deserve any better fate than they had. You don't deserve any credit for having achieved anything uh, that would be praiseworthy as over uh, to, to live with that praise more than any of them did. Uh, so I have found myself expunging the word deserve from my vocabulary. I don't think I deserve anything yet in this world today. I hear it so often, you deserve this, you deserve that, I deserve this. I, I think the biblical picture is Jesus would have us um, expunge that word from our vocabulary. And a f another what about? What about my sin? What about the anxiety, discomfort, lack of calmness that my sin gives me? I have many regrets. Things I've done wrong, people I've hurt. What about that? Well, Jeff, says Jesus, it's all gift. I have given you the freedom if you avail yourself of it, of my forgiveness. I absorbed it all onto the cross, nailed it to the cross, and it's been forgiven and forgotten, and you're free. And, and my, my apostle John, says Jesus, he told you about this. Jeff, if you confess your sins, if you look squarely and honestly into your heart, and see the ugliness of what's there, what you've done, what you could do, uh, what's potentially wrong. And you admit it, confess it, repent from it, tell God you are sorry and you don't want any part of it. Guess what? God is faithful and just. The justice came on the cross to forgive you of all sin. You're forgiven and cleansed. That is a freedom. That is a peace like no other. When you glimpse that through repentance and confession, that you uh, come up out of the waters of baptism, cleansed and whole and free from sin, that's freedom. That's a peace, a peace that passes understanding. And then the Apostle Paul goes on, and he tells us, here's how to get rid of your anxiety. Be sure to pray to God. Bring your petitions to him and do it with thanksgiving. In other words, thank God for the his answering the request before you make the request. If you wait until an answer to your prayer, you'll never be at peace. You'll wonder, where is God? Why isn't he doing this? Is God punishing me? All those things. But if you thank God in advance and say to him, I am confident that you will do what is best for me in this situation, regardless of what it looks like to me now. If you are able to say, God, I know that you know uh, things I don't know. And that if I knew what you knew, I would be praying right now the answer to prayer that is going to come, not necessarily the one that I would uh, be asking for at the present time. Before I was married, well, I was divorced and then I entered the dating scene. And in re-entering the dating scene, I made a list of all the qualities that I wanted in a spouse. And I think it was something like between nine and 12 different qualities. And Kathy knows this list. I had told it to her. And, and she doesn't match half of them. One of them on there, believe it or not, as trite and as I am, is, uh, you know, I wanted someone to play tennis. She didn't play tennis. God did not give me my list. He gave me a person. He gave me the perfect person for me in my life over the last between 30 and 40 years of, of knowing her. Um, and that's because God knew what I needed. God knows, knew what she needed. Unbelievably, it's me somehow, some way. But 
If we review right now, we can say these things. Fundamentally, life is all gift. It's not about what I earned or deserve. Fundamentally, it's about thanking God regardless of all circumstances. Fundamentally, it's about coming clean with what's inside you with repentance. And finally, here's a, uh, a Christmas song. I didn't know about this Christmas song. Um, it's called, um, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Before I say that, I want to say something about Charles Spafford, Horatio Spafford. You know, his, his children died on a ship, in a shipwreck over the ocean, five children, and his wife survived while he was back in Chicago. He got a, he got a, uh, a telegram from his wife. It said, um, only I was saved. And it was crushing because he knew that his four daughters had died. He, the telegram actually said, saved alone. He got on the ship. And while the ship was over where his daughters had died, he wrote this, he wrote this, uh, this poem, which became the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And in it, he wrote, um, Satan, though Satan may buffet me. Well, how would Satan buffet him? Well, God, how could you have allowed, allowed this to happen? God, why me? All of those questions. But he goes on to write, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well, it is well with my soul. How could he say that? Because he couldn't, he just couldn't blame God, because God already had died for him and his daughters. God had lost a son and he came to redeem the world. He's putting all things together for good for those who love the world. How could he blame God when he knows the God of Jesus Christ? And finally, this uh, Civil War song. Uh, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, written by the most famous um, American poet probably as ever, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In 1863, his wife was making a craft. Uh, her dress caught on fire and she burned and he couldn't save her and he was distraught. Shortly after that, he got a telegram and he discovered that his son was wounded as a Union soldier in one of the uh, Civil War battles. And so he went to Washington and uh, found his son and began nursing him back to health. And here is this astonishing poem that he wrote. I hope you look it up and play it for yourself on the, uh, on the internet. He writes this. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then, in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, Singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant, sublime, of peace on earth, good will to men. This is the peace of God offered to humanity that cannot be conjured up by any technique. It's a gift. It's all gift. And it's my prayer that you experience 
the gift of peace from God in Jesus Christ this Advent season. God bless you all, and, uh, and uh, have a great week. Bye-bye.